Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning to you who are viewing online. We pray the Lord is with you, and you've been staying safe, and things are good things are happening in your lives, and we uh, look forward when we can all be together again uh, here, uh, live and in person, and so we know that day is coming soon, hopefully. All right, this morning we're going to turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 6 as we continue our study, verse by verse study through Luke. Uh, and last week, uh, Tony's teaching ended with Jesus calling his disciples and to follow him and be with him. And today we begin in verse 17 of Luke 6, and we shall see that Jesus began to give his disciples the basis for what it means to live a blessed life as being a part of the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, they will begin to see what he meant by not putting the new wine of the kingdom uh, and the kingdom life, according to his spirit, into the old wineskins uh, that were legalistic, uh, short-sighted, and oppressive interpretations of the Mosaic law. So, uh, you know, when, er, several weeks ago we mentioned that Luke is all about discipleship. It's all about being a learner. It's all about following in the footsteps of Jesus and learning to be like him and incorporating the kingdom of heaven into our daily life. And so that's what this is about today. So let's look at uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out of him and healed them all. Now, the description of where the multitude had come from was Luke's way of saying that they really came from all parts of Israel, from the top to the bottom. You know, they were all coming around, they'd heard about Jesus, and they were coming to hear from him, to learn from him, and to be healed by him and set free by Jesus. And so uh, this great multitude was there. After Jesus had ministered healing among the multitude, though, he recognized that he needed to call his disciples away from the multitude, and he had some things he wanted to teach them uh, in terms of their experiencing the kingdom of heaven. And now, you know, the title of my message today, if I were to give it a title, is The Blessed Life. And so he wants to tell them how to have a blessed life, a life that is blessed according to the kingdom. And so that's what we all invite and embrace this morning as well. So... Uh, this is uh, happening like uh, Matthew taught in the Sermon on the Mount, but here it's the Sermon on the Plain. And so we see something here that Jesus consistently repeated his teaching to his disciples. Why did he do that? Well, they were slow learners. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that for yourself? You know, oh, I thought I understood that and I'd learned that, but here I go again, you know. So they sometimes were slow learners, and, and Jesus had to repeat himself to them numerous times. And so this is the Sermon on the Plain. So in verse 20, it says, Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, in, in Matthew's account, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So uh, to be poor in spirit means that to be humble in spirit, to be yielded in spirit, to recognizing a person's own spiritual poverty. Uh, so uh, that, that spiritual poverty, when we recognize that, we will know and experience the blessed life of God's kingdom. Uh, and so... To be blessed is to experience the rewards of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven has many benefits and blessings attached to it, and the least of which is an inner sense of well-being and that you are walking in harmony with God our Father. And there's no better thing than that. I tell you, when you know in your spirit and your heart that things are okay with, between you and God and, and that you are walking in step with Him, and so there's that harmonizing in life that goes on between us and the Lord. And so that's a blessed thing, the inner sense of well-being and harmony with God. So the first step into the blessed life uh, is being poor in spirit. The world tells us, uh, get rich and be happy. You know, if you could just be rich. You know, I, I 
told this story before, but one time I went out to the mailbox and I got an envelope out and it was from a bank uh, that I didn't have, I didn't think I had an account in. It, 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 the truth was I had, uh, I think our will was registered uh, in that bank or something. And, uh, but anyways, I got this bank statement that said I was worth one and a half million dollars. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know, I'd just, uh, I'd just been praying and and uh, the, a, a sense that the Lord had spoken to me while I was praying, if, if you were rich, would you still preach the gospel? You know. And so I got that envelope out of the mail, and that was my first test. You know, he said, well, this, if, I, if this was true, and this was many years ago, so it was worth a lot more than a million and a half is today. But, but anyways, uh, so I, I said to myself, yes, I would still preach the gospel. Because that's not where it all is. It's not in financial or material wealth that true meaning and purpose in life and fulfillment of life comes. And that's what Jesus is telling these guys. Just a casual look at the media tells you that there's lots of rich folks uh, who are unhappy rather than happy. Uh, and so uh, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes that chasing after wealth is vanity like chasing after the wind. Uh, to be poor in spirit means an attitude of deep humility and admitted powerlessness. And this is portrayed, you know, back when we, we uh, saw that passage where uh, Peter, uh, Jesus brought his boat, Simon Peter, and, and uh, he taught from the boat for a while. Then he asked Peter to go out further into the sea, and he caught it. They fished all night and caught nothing, but when Jesus said, go out here, you know, he followed his word and his directions, and he came back with a huge load of fish. And so then Peter fell on his, uh, his face before the Lord at the knees of Jesus, the scripture says. And this is what he said. He said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's what it means to be poor in spirit, is to recognize that, that, that in and of ourselves, we have fished all night and caught nothing, you know. That's what's left, nothing, you know. And so being a, listening to Christ and what he tells us to do and calls us to do, that's when good things happen. Uh, John Calvin said, he only who is reduced to nothing in himself and relies on the mercy of God is poor in spirit. So the person who is poor in spirit reaches that point of understanding that, uh, you know, that his own resources, his or her own resources and talents and abilities are not enough to provide happiness. Uh, and, and you know the attitude, if I could just find myself if I could just gain control, if I could just get some recognition in life, uh, if I could just get the chance to do my own thing, if I could get ahead of the other guy, I'll be happy. But we never are. You know, it's always something more that we feel like we have to have in order to be happy. So who could speak more realistically about the illusion of self-focused value system than a guy named Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who suffered deprivation in prison for all that money can buy. And uh, so here in the Prison Chronicle, uh, this is what he wrote. He said, don't be afraid of misfortune and do not yearn after happiness. It is, after all, all the same. The bitter doesn't last forever and the sweet never fills the cup to overflowing. It is enough if you don't freeze in the cold and if hunger and thirst don't claw at your sides if your back isn't broken, if your feet can walk, if both arms work, if both eyes can see, and if both ears can hear, then whom should you envy? Rub your eyes and purify your heart and prize above all else in the world those who love you and wish you well. Amen. So here was a man who literally had nothing as he was banned you know, to an isolated place in prison. And he recognized that being that poverty of spirit Spirit opens up a person's heart and life to something that is more meaningful than riches and than material goods in this world could provide. So uh, then Jesus said this. He said, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. In Matthew's account, Jesus says, blessed are you who mourn, they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so now he adds, uh, Luke's uh, addition adds in the word laughter as part of that comfort, that's joy. So righteousness... Uh, is one of those things which has more than one application. Hungering for righteousness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. What does it mean? It means to be blameless, to have a clean conscience. It means to be right with God and to not have anything at all between us and God. Uh, it means that which is just and right in the eyes of God. Now, the person who has become yielded to God 
you know, and other-centered, will desire in his or her own heart what is right and good in the eyes of the Lord and what is right and good for people around them. And so there's this other-centeredness that comes with it. To hunger and thirst is to crave or intensely desire something. Uh, Jesus is telling us that those who seek after the kingdom of God will experience an ever-increasing appetite for that which is right, good, and just from God's point of view. So, you know, when you haven't eaten in a while, you're hungry, right? And so when we come to the Lord and we're poverty-stricken spiritually, we're hungry and we're thirsty. And we don't have what is needed on the inside. You know, by the end of this service, I'm going to be hungry for food. Because all I had this morning was a little thing of yogurt. You know, that's what I've been doing in the mornings lately. It's more healthy, I suppose. Uh, but uh, yogurt with granola poured into it, you know. And I, I try to fill it up to the brim, that little cup with <laughs> granola, because it just makes it easier on me <laughs> to do that. But, you know, we hunger for things. To hunger and thirst, to crave something more than what we already have that God would give us. Uh, and so uh, we want to have an appetite for what's better for us and how things need to change in us as well. In fact, that which is not right, that is not just and good in us will become disgusting to us when we, our eyes are opened to what is righteous. We don't want to stay the same. We don't want to remain the way we've been. We want to change. Uh, like John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, he was the captain of a slave ship, uh, and so he traded in slaves, and, and uh, he, uh, he was in the middle of a horrible storm on May the 10th in 1748, and he was desperate, and, and in his desperation, he called out to God. Uh, how many have done that? It wasn't until a, a moment of great crisis that they realized they needed the Lord. Uh, and so he called out to God and gave his heart and life to the Lord, and he gave up the slave trade. That's what happened to him. He began to hunger and thirst for what was just and righteous, and slavery was not part of that. In fact, it was anathema to the, the justice of God and what was good for those poor people. And he became heartbroken over the injustice of slavery, mourning over his own participation in it. Uh, and so Newton eventually became a minister and wrote the words to this great song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved, saved a wretch. He knew he had been a wretch for a long time. And that and the amazing grace of Christ had saved him, this wretch of a slave trader. And because of grace in his own life, he grew to hate the injustice of slavery. Uh, and he became a man of meekness who hungered and thirsted, thirsted for righteousness. And if you ever get a chance, I've mentioned this before, but there's a movie that was made called Amazing Grace. And it was about the, the, the uh, banishment of slavery in, in, the Brit in, in, in England and uh, its uh, colonies. Uh, and uh, this man, John Newton, was a major force behind that uh, and his influence over certain members of the parliament uh, who came to him for advice. He was a pastor. He was a minister in England. And so he passed on that hunger and thirsting for what was just and righteous to those. Now, listen, in all of us, there are things that need to be transformed. And when we find ourselves yielded to the rule of Christ, then we crave the writing of what is long in, wrong in our lives uh, and the injustice in the world around us. Then he says, blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Now Matthew's account says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Luke's account says, weeping shall turn into laughter. Uh, and uh, those of you who have gone through significant grief, like Vicki and I have this, this past year, the loss of all of our, many of our loved ones, including our parents, you know, there, there's, there are days when you just think sadness will never leave you, you know. Uh, and, and then there comes a time when you can laugh again, you know. And so, there, you know, so sadness can turn into laughter. Uh, and so Luke says that when we're poverty-stricken spiritually and starving for righteousness, what do we wind up doing eventually? We begin to weep in sorrow over our condition of unrighteousness. And so when we experience the grace of God and mercy of God, though, we are freed to laugh 
and express joy in the Lord because we've been set free from those things that have held us back from experiencing real life. So when we experience that grace, we are freed to laugh and express joy in the Lord. When we reach the end of our self-focused assumptions and find disappointment and disillusionment, the sorrow we feel can be overwhelming. Uh, Dr. Jerome Frank at John Hopkins uh, talks about our assumptive world, okay? What he means is that all of us make assumptions about life, about God, about ourselves, about others, about the way things are. You know that's true. He goes on to argue that when our assumptions are true to reality, then we live relatively happy lives, okay, uh, and well-adjusted lives. But when our assumptions are distant from reality then we become confused and angry and disillusioned. Now listen, the kingdom of God is not based on assumptions. How many times have older people in my life when I was a young guy told me, now Jerry, you're assuming that. Don't ever assume anything, <laughs> you know, because it doesn't really always work out the way you think it's going to work out. So assumptions, much of our life at times is based on assumptions that aren't true. And so, but the kingdom of God is not based on assumptions, it's based on reality from heaven's point of view, okay? Uh, kingdom living replaces sorrow with laughter. Jesus was challenging the assumptive world of his disciples. They were full of assumptions. And uh, they would sometimes, when he said something, they'd go, huh, I don't get that. And that's because they had assumed something else, you know. And Jesus had to change their mind, the way they thought about things, the way they viewed things, the way they perceived life. It needed to change. It needed to be different. And so uh, he wanted them to see uh, things from heaven's point of view. And, and so uh, his teaching challenges our assumptions as well. And we need to allow that to happen. We need to say, okay, uh, I, I assumed this was the way it was, but I'm now seeing through Christ and through the kingdom of God that, uh, hey, it's real different from that. Uh, and, and so he challenges our assumptions as, as well. Verse 22, blessed are you when men hate you. Now, we would assume that no one could be blessed when they're hated, right? <laughs> so he says, blessed are, men when, uh, are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did so to the prophets. Now, you know, nobody would assume that that's the way we ought to live, that when we're persecuted and hated by people around us, that we should just say, hey, yay, you know, and jump for joy. That just doesn't make sense, does it? Well, that's what we assume. But Jesus says otherwise, okay? Why is that? So here we see the reality when people believe and do what is righteous in this world, they are in the minority, okay? Uh, and it exposes the evil around them. The pro prophets in the Old Testament, they were never popular. Um, and, uh, you know, Jeremiah wept over that. He wanted to be liked, you know, but they call, he was called Jeremiah the weeping prophet, you know, uh, because the prophets spoke the truth about the condition of the world and about sin uh, and calling people to repentance. And they weren't well liked because they spoke the truth. Uh, so darkness hates the light. Jesus is basically saying that when you are persecuted for taking a stand for what is right, then rejoice. Because your Father in heaven is on your side, and it stores up a reward. And so we know that God is for us. We, we sang about it today. He's for us and not against us. And if he is for us, who can be against us? You know, And we rejoice in that he is for us. Now Jesus next gives the flip side to living as part of the kingdom of God. He gives these as woes that displace what should have been, could have been blessings in people's lives. So let's look at this in verse 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Now, question. So what's wrong with being rich? <laughs> you know, 
Uh, well, uh, let's see perhaps this, that the second half of the sentence here gives us a clue as to what Jesus actually means here. The interpretation based on word meanings for the, for the word that's uh, translated as consolation here is that the rich person may falsely assume, there's that assumption again, falsely assume that wealth provides all that is needed for sufficiency and fulfillment in life. Again, if I could just win the lottery, right? I would be happy. Well, have you ever studied the lives of those who won the lottery? Uh, most of them wound up losing it all. And they, you know, they, they just, uh, you know, they, they realized that people around them were just hanging on to them and being friends to them, supposed friends, for their money. And, and eventually they, they lost much of their sense of fulfillment and purpose in life because it was all put in the category of riches and that had supposedly was going to make them happy. So he, Jesus is saying that if being rich is what is the primary aim of a person's life, then that is all they're going to get. Yeah, they're not going to get other things, so many other things that are much more important to life. Uh, so they will miss out on the more worthy things in life. In Luke's writing, he seems to focus... Uh, mostly on those who have stored up wealth with no thought of investing it into the kingdom of God or in the lives of others or doing good with it. And there's a story, and this comes later in Luke's uh, gospel account. It, it shows up in the other gospel accounts as well. But there is the, the story of the rich young ruler who, when given the opportunity to follow Jesus, was too attached to his wealth to do so. Uh, he was in a dilemma. He walked away sorrowful. And there's a certain freedom to not being encumbered with things. He had the opportunity to be a kingdom giver and follow Jesus. And that's what Jesus had asked him to do, is to sell everything and give it away uh, and, and follow Jesus. But he chose the temporal consolation of his riches. It said for he had many properties. He had much land and possessions. And he just couldn't let go to follow Jesus. So right after this encounter, Jesus said this to his disciples. And this is from Mark chapter 10, verse 24. Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, the rich young ruler was having an existential crisis. He was unhappy on the inside. He, he was conflicted. He liked Jesus. He liked what Jesus was saying. And yet, he, he was conflicted because he had dedicated himself to managing all this property and having all this wealth and all of that and, what the, and the notoriety it brought to him and the opportunity to govern as a young man and all of that. All these things became so important to him, and yet he was conflicted because he knew Jesus was telling the truth, but it, it, it clashed within him with what he had dedicated his life to. And so that's what you call an existential crisis. That's what it means. He was a good moral person. He had everything he needed. But in his inner life, he was conflicted to relinquish the hold riches had over his life would have freed him to receive real joy and the opportunity to follow Jesus into the sense of being and purpose and meaning in life that Jesus wanted him to experience. And so even though he had all those riches, he didn't realize that spiritually he was bankrupt and he needed something else to truly make him rich in other ways. Verse 25, Jesus said, Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Now there is a, a short-lived superficial laughter that does not remain. You know, we, we can get, uh, you know, somebody can, uh, fun, we can watch a funny TV show and laugh, you know, like until we cry sometimes. And, uh, or we can, you know, we can uh, see something that uh, makes it funny and uh, and we laugh, but that doesn't stay with us. It doesn't remain. And so eventually it's replaced with weeping uh, at the end of one's life, perhaps over wasted time and wasted living. 
We're reminded of the lament by, the, by King Solomon at the end of his life. And he too, like the rich young ruler, had an existential crisis. There was an inner conflict within him when he recognized that so much of what he had dedica dedicated his life to, he was probably the wealthiest person on earth and, and uh, had fame, the most famous person on earth at that time, and yet he was unhappy. And so he too had that ex existential crisis we talked about. Ecclesiastes 2, 2, he, he said this, I said of laughter and of mirth, what does it accomplish? And he recognized that it was not something that had remained with him over time. The king was in essence weeping over counterfeit joy when rejoicing in the Lord would have given him real joy. In fact, later on in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, after he said this, in chapter 3 he said, the best thing you can do in life is to rejoice in the Lord. That's, a, that's what makes a person truly happy, to rejoice in the Lord and rejoice in Him. And so temporal laughter is not the abiding joy of the kingdom that expresses delight in the presence of the Lord. Solomon could have written the song, Both Sides Now. How many of you remember that song by Joni Mitchell? Any of you remember that? A few of you? Yeah. Because it was, it was real popular many years ago. But uh, here, here's what it says. Just a couple of lines from it. It says, I've looked at life from both sides now from win and lose. And still somehow it's life's illusions I recall. I really don't know life at all. So Solomon, you know, he couldn't recall the really good times he had had. Uh, he only recalled them now as illusions that didn't provide what his soul longed for. What his heart needed and so he seemed to be saying that pleasure and industry and human wisdom, acquiring riches, popularity and fame, fulfillment of desires, laughter, learning and knowledge are only illusions of real life. They are not life at all. So he seemed to say that his journey has been like a treadmill. He's logged lots of miles but never gone anywhere. So that's the way life can be. And at the end of his life, he was sorrowful about it. Uh, but he remembered the Lord in his old age. And he, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of true wisdom. And the knowledge of God is what really provides an inner sense of joy, that presence of knowing God. And so he returned to the Lord in his old age. Uh, and then he asked the young people of his nation to remember their creator in the days of their youth before they got old, like he had become. And so that's the challenge, that's the call to us. Verse 26, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now, only false prophets are really, really popular. <laughs> uh, because of speaking what the world wants to hear. You know, if you meet a prophet and he tells you everything you'd like to, <laughs> you, that you want to hear, then they're probably a false prophet, you know. Uh, have you noticed that the more Jesus spoke the truth of the kingdom, the more persecution followed him? <laughs> and so the kingdom of God is paradoxical. Someone has said that a paradox is a truth that's standing on its head to get noticed. It's kind of upside down in a way. And so one must become poor in his or own, her own eyes in order to be truly rich. Uh, a person must first become hungry for righteousness before being filled uh, a person must first weep over his or her need for the kingdom intervention before being filled with joy. Jesus Christ invites all of us to embrace the kingdom of God that challenges all of our assumptions, but to do so, we are called to give up all other things that rule over us or control our lives and offer it up to him. Uh, later on in Luke's gospel account, he Jesus, he has Jesus telling this person, uh, unless you give up everything you possess and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Now, why was he saying that we should just, uh, you know, sell everything out and, and, uh, and just live on the street? Well, some people may be called to do that. I don't know. But the thing is, is that uh, we need to kind of let those other things not dominate our lives and our time and our energy and rule over us but turn our greatest attention toward the Lord. And so one might say that, uh, well, that's, that's too risky. 
that perhaps the greatest risk by far is to hold on to false assumptions so long that at the end of our lives we wind up remaining spiritually bankrupt and then we weep with regrets like Solomon did. Verse 27, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, let's take a moment to digest this. <laughs> you know, it may leave us with a little bit of an uncomfortable feeling, you know. Jesus is asking us to love those people that we consider to be enemies. Uh, now, who hate us and have cursed us and spitefully used us. The love Jesus speaks about here is, in the Greek language, is called agape, agape love. In the Greek language, there were several words that are translated as love, and one is based on attraction and passion. Uh, another is based on commonality and friendship. Uh, agape is based neither on attraction or friendship. It simply means to choose for another's highest and most benevolent good, okay? Regardless of what their relationship to us might be or whether we're attracted to them or not uh, or have things in common with them or not. So Jesus is saying that one can know that the kingdom of God has clearly come into his or her life when making choices based on agape, uh, even with one's enemy. So that's the real test of the kingdom, isn't it? Whether or not we can love someone who not only does not love us, but perhaps hates us or spitefully uses us. So agape love is a choice that does not wait for someone to first treat us in loving ways. Jesus gives some directives as to how, this, how to love one's enemies. First of all, do good to them who hate you. This is based on deficit and need. For instance, the Apostle Paul, when he uh, echoed this same truth, he said to feed them, in terms of your enemies, feed them if they're hungry, give them something to drink if they're thirsty, and give them a source of heat if they are cold. That's how you would love your enemy, uh, do good to them. Uh, so uh, then he says, bless them who curse you. This is the second thing he says. So uh, we are not to curse them in return for them cursing us. What we're tempted to, though, aren't we? Uh, instead, we are to bless them. Now, Barnes says that the word bless here means to speak well of them. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, I, I remember somebody in my life, could have been my grandmother, telling me at one point, Jerry, no matter who you meet in life, there's something good you can find in them that you can talk about, you know, that you can mention. And so to speak well of them, and, and more specifically, maybe this is more accurate, not to speak trash about them. <laughs> you know, in other words, don't trash them because they trashed you, Okay. To bless might mean to express hope that they will no longer be our enemies and that transformation can happen for them. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't think Jesus is really thinking about politics or war, world wars or anything like that or even what's happening in the Ukraine, okay? But I, I tell you, uh, the next thing he says is pray for them that spitefully use you. How many of us have been praying for Mr. Putin this week? I've been pretty upset with that guy. I have not been able to think much of anything good to say about him. <laughs> but I want to tell you this, I have prayed for that man. That he would repent and become a godly man. Wouldn't that be the most awesome thing in the world? I think it would. The word spitefully describes being treated with insults. I have rarely thought of people as my enemies. I'm thankful that I haven't had a lot of people I could say, well, that's my enemy right there. But uh, I have been the recipient of being spitefully used a number of times. Okay? Uh, and so I wondered how I should pray for those who have spitefully used me. Uh, here's what the Holy Spirit impressed upon me. 
It is that I should pray that those individuals would repent and become godly people. That's what I prayed for with Mr. Putin. Even though those people caused me suffering, the glad news, let me tell you, the glad news is that a number of them repented and sought to make amends with me. And I believe the prayer was effective and powerful in their lives. To pray for them that they would turn away from that, and, and they, they did. Perhaps prayer is the only safe way to love a person who spitefully uses us. Pray for them. Verse 29, to him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. Now some have suggested that Jesus was referring to uh, the, a backhanded slap, you know, to a person's face that was an insult among the Jews. Another interesting take on this is that later when Christians were discovered in synagogues, uh, then they were ritually slapped on the cheek for being heretics. Uh, and uh, I believe that when Jesus was standing in front of the Sanhedrin that they slapped him because they were accusing him of blasphemy. Jesus is not advocating any of us putting ourselves in harm's way. What he is saying is this. If someone insults us or speaks evil of us, we are not to do the same to them. The hope is that by not striking back, opportunity for resolution will come. Many, many years ago, when I was a young minister, uh, I, a friend told me of a man who was speaking harshly about me to others and uh, is doing this behind my back. Uh, and so I immediately wanted to pick up the phone and give him a piece of my mind. Uh, and I did do that a few times in my younger years, <laughs> I have to admit to you. Uh, but as I picked up the phone, it was like the Lord Jesus was standing right next to me and whispering in my ear, saying, don't do it. <laughs> and, he, and he said, leave it to me. And so I did. I let it go. I put the phone down. And for two years, I left it alone. I never responded to that man's harsh judgment of me. Then one day, I received a telephone call from him, and he invited me to lunch, where he wept and told me how he had misjudged me and how sorry he was for how he had spoken about me to others. You see, given time, it doesn't always happen immediately. In this case, it was two years. But given time, given time, turning the other cheek can be very effective. And so while you turn the other cheek, you forgive and you pray for that person. Let's continue on in the scripture here. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. So we begin to get the picture that kingdom living is to be free from ongoing relationship conflicts over material things. How many conflicts take place over material things, right? Uh, so I'd, I've seen people leave our church over that, where somebody upset them over some you know, transaction of some kind. And they say, well, I can't go to church with them anymore. So they left. And I'm going, can't you sit down together and sort it out? And, and then look what Jesus says here. This is the kingdom way of doing that. You know, he's, he says, can you imagine Jesus asking a disciple to go minister in a certain city? And he says, well, I'll go as soon as that guy gives me back what he borrowed from me. You know, and I'm going to camp on his doorstep till he does. You know, well, Jesus wanted these disciples to be freed up from that kind of thing so that they could go and minister in his name and not be held back by their ill feelings towards someone who failed to return something borrowed or failed to pay them back for some money that they had borrowed. And, and so um, it's, it, he says in verse 31, And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. And of course, we know this is known as the golden rule, right? 
Uh, kingdom relationships are kept strong for, by doing for others what we want others to do for us. So when I've really hurt somebody or done something to somebody and, and I ask forgiveness and they forgive me, well, what happens then with me when somebody, you know, that, that, uh, that I, where, where I, need, I need to forgive them, you know? And so we've, it's forgiveness has come to me, so I forgive someone else for hurting me. Giving for the needs of others without demanding repayment frees us from relationship entanglements that come with demands and unreal expectations of others. The person doing this will be blessed. To be freed from that is amazing. You know, not to have to deal with that from the inside. Again, existential conflicts, existential crisis moments, you know, when we get hung up on what people have taken from us. Okay? So... Verse 32, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. Uh, so here Jesus is showing that the kingdom of God is proactive in going beyond the limited expectations of love, compassion, and hospitality offered by the world. But love your enemies, verse 35, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful." So here is the pivotal issue. In the kingdom of God, the primary objective is to live as children of God. And as children of God, we emulate him. We follow in his ways. And the nature of our father is described here. He is kind and to the unthankful and the evil. He is kind to those who are unthankful and kind to those who are evil. He is abounding in mercy Paul wrote of the riches of God's forbearance and long-suffering and kindness that that is what leads people to repentance. You know, it's a, you know, when I see people with placards out on the street saying, you're going to hell, you know, and you better make it right or you're going to hell. Well, first of all, we can't make it right. Jesus did that for us. And the objective of the gospel is not to cry out judgment against people, but to give them the opportunity to get freed from judgment, you know, and the opportunity to be free from all of that. And so we are able to be just, merciful just as our Father is merciful. And part of what it means to love our enemies is to forgive them when they repent, uh, knowing that if God has forgiven them, so should we. So Jesus has challenge the assumptive world of his disciples. And it is clear that Jesus wants his disciples to be free from the entanglements of relationship problems, vindictiveness and conflicts over material things. He wants to break down all their false assumptions and replace them with kingdom reality. These entanglements and false assumptions will also keep us from experiencing the blessed life according to the kingdom of God. Don't you want to experience that? He wants us to be free from the love of money so much that we are willing to give it away. He wants us to take on the love of God that he has for people so much that we will even love our enemies. There are people who say that these principles of the kingdom of God taught by Jesus are just idealistic standards that we can never reach. E. Stanley Jones, he wrote this marvelous book called The Unshakable Kingdom, says this about that idea. He says that these are not idealism, but are the reality of the kingdom they make sense, and the ways of the world are nonsense. 
And so much of our assumptive world is nonsense. And Jesus turns it on its head, those nonsensical things, and makes sense of them from the kingdom point of view. The kingdom of God is living life and relating to people God's way. And so it is the way to a blessed life. So let us take time. Let us take time to think about false assumptions in our lives. That the teaching of Jesus concerning the kingdom of heaven is meant to correct. And give us a real a dose of reality. Uh, you know, Kelly prayed earlier about truth with a capital T. Do you know what truth is? It's reality from God's point of view. It's reality from heaven's point of view is what it is. And that's what Jesus said will set you free. The truth shall set you free. It's the truth of the, heaven, of, 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 of the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, <laughs> surrender these things to, and follow Jesus. Then weeping turns into laughter. So let us lay aside our assumptive worlds and seek after the kingdom of God and as a really great replacement for it. If we do, then the blessed life will follow. Let's stand together.